Hi, I'm Tamara, and this is Telus Talks with Tamara Taggart. Stress is a part of our everyday lives. To help us identify and understand our stress triggers and to learn some coping mechanisms for them, we're speaking with psychologist and author Dr. Robin Hanley Defoe today. It's a great conversation. I hope you enjoy it. Hi, Robin. It's great to see you. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you, Tamara. So I was thinking, you know, as I was frantically getting ready to sit down here and talk with you about stress and how we can stress wisely, I thought to myself, am I stressed out right now because I couldn't get my child out the door properly for school and I, you know, I'm, I don't want to be late for Robin and I'm running downstairs and I'm frantically getting ready. And I thought, well, this is a timely conversation, isn't it? Because I think we all are stressed, but we don't know how to stress wisely. Yeah, I feel that on every level. And that's very much the origin story you just described as to why I got so curious about this topic. The reality is stress is so inherent to our days, yet we're never really taught how to like manage it or work with it. Yet we spend a lot of our energy trying to get rid of it versus learning how to work with it. Do we know what stress is? Like, do you think the average person understands what stress is like is our idea of stress right because to me when i think back oh stress means you you look totally frazzled and you you just can see the stress on somebody but sometimes we hide it quite well don't we absolutely you're absolutely right and to answer your first question do people actually know what it is i think on some level intuitively we recognize when we are experiencing like the extremes of stress like that over committed that frazzledness. Everything feels urgent. We feel this deep depletion, yet we chase. And it just feels like this anxiety, right? I think people are very familiar what that feels like. In terms of like the purpose and like the underlying reasons behind stress, I don't know if that's so much common knowledge. And that's very much why I wanted to put this work together in a book to help people understand like the biological reason behind stress. Because stress isn't our enemy. If anything, it's our greatest ally for us living really great lives when we understand how it is and how do we actually harness some of that energy so it can work with us versus us working against it. Mm, Okay. So what would you say to somebody who says, you know, I like, what is stress? I don't, I don't think I am stressed. I don't think I, I don't think I feel stressed. Yeah, totally. Great question. Okay. So from the kind of the biological background, stress is connected to our, essentially our nervous systems. And what it does is it gives us like energy. It gives us focus. It kind of gives us drive. Like stress is like a fuel essentially in the form of what we call cortisol. So our bodies make this biological reaction to the environment we're in for us to be able to show up and do the things that we do. And the reality is that like it also is connected to our survival system, right? It's the same nervous system that can activate that fight or flight system that we know keeps us alive in dangerous situations. But I'll share with you, Tamara, what we're seeing the most of, though, is there's like two subsystems of our nervous systems that folks don't always know a lot about, which is the freezing tendency and the fawning tendency. Now, freezing is when our lives are super busy and we just literally just like frozen on the spot. We can't even string a sentence together. We forget important things like we literally deer in the headlights. And that's a real common reaction in our bodies. And the second, that fawning response is when we essentially placate. Like our body interprets the world and says, you know what, it's better just to say yes than rock the boat. I need to be easy to love. I have to make sure everything is okay, not to rock the boat, not to cause any, you know, disruptions. And I think a lot of what you're describing and I'm seeing with a lot of communities that I work with is that we're very much in that state where we're we're just barely coping because we just don't want to, we just don't know another way to do this. So uh, you said something really interesting there that made me think about how many people I know that never say no. They never say no. And I, I, I think I'm also that person. I'm, I try so hard to be better at it, right? Like I think it was Amy Poehler that said no is a complete sentence. (laughs) It's so true, right? Does that, is, is that what you're talking about? Like, is that a stress thing? Absolutely. So us and our inability to like say no uh, or having kind of that disease to please where we don't want to deal with the consequences of like upsetting people or disappointing people. That is a stress response. 
And so that's very much this idea about like, we don't get to choose whether or not we like fight, whether we run away, whether we freeze and can't even say a sentence, or if we just go along with things. Like we don't get to pick. Our body will biologically make the decision to say, this is Tamara's best chance of getting out of this uncomfortable situation. So we know that, you know, let's say, for example, you accepted an invitation to a barbecue this weekend, you're depleted, you're exhausted, it's the last thing you want to do. Your body literally says yes to that person because you don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. And what's interesting is all we're actually doing is like getting out of the discomfort of the moment because our survival is just about the moment. It's not even thinking about the discomfort you're going to feel for the next three or four days wishing you hadn't made that commitment because your brain knows I'll deal with that later. I just have to get out of this moment right now. So that's what we talk about why for some folks it's hard. But I I just want to hold space that I think sometimes people think like, oh, I'm, I'm really weak or like I'm a pushover. I wish I can be more assertive. But we have to understand, and this is the idea of working with our biology, our body is making that almost choice for us because it's like a reflex. And then we have to deal with the consequences. So yes, I love that saying that no is a complete sentence, but I think we need to give ourselves just a wee bit of like grace to recognize that we're doing the best we can in these moments because our lives are so full. You just explained, I think, I think anybody that's listening right now who hasn't who has said yes to the barbecue, yes. yes to this, yes, I'll I'll bake the cupcakes for the school play, I'll do the this, I'll do the that. And then you're right, you get to the moment or the day before or the day up and you're like, why did I say yes to this? Why did I do this? And then you're stuck with a new stress, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. Where it's like, now I'm stressed about that I got to make these stupid cupcakes and I don't want to make them. And I start going through my head, like, what are some things I can do to get out of it? And this is a whole other... I've. I've just prolonged my stress. Really? Absolutely. Absolutely. And this is a repetitive right. pattern. And the more that we do it, right, the more that it reinforces ourselves that, you know what, despite that discomfort, we always figure it out, right? Like we make the cupcakes, we show up, we do the thing. So then on this other side of our psychology, we get reinforced and we feel like a martyr because look <laughs> what I was able to do. And then unfortunately, that starts to feel really good. So we go through this distress cycle, we respond, we react, you know, and it's not very pleasant, but then we do it. And then it's like, it's literally like we keep falling on these swords and that gives us a deep sense of like, look how much I'm sacrificing for the people I love. That makes me feel like I'm a good parent. I'm a good partner. I'm a good person. I'm a good friend. So that's a very common cycle we do. And it's way more exhausting and complicated than it needs to be if we learn how to work with our reactions in our stress systems in a proactive way versus trying to do that latter type of a response. That's amazing. And I feel like we can end the podcast right, right now. There. <laughs> I've had like a major epiphany like, no, but this is fascinating. So here's a question. Do, do women and men... Um, you know, do 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 we stress differently or or do people just stress the same right across the board? Yeah. Another amazing question. So, yes, there are gender differences in how people stress, but I would argue it's not as much a biological cause versus how we've been raised and groomed and conditioned. So, you know, even, for example, to kind of stick on the busy household topic, you know, for example, when somebody drops by our house, all right. And let's say the house, I have three teenagers, two dogs, three rescue cats, right. and it's in construction. Right. So you imagine it's in you were in my life. Yes. Yeah. It's literally this like circus. Somebody drops by unexpectedly. And then the, let's say the breakfast dishes are still out or my suitcases because I've been on the road for the last five weeks are still at the front door. And like the house is topsy turvy and that person visits and then they leave. At no point in that whole exchange would my husband feel as though, wow, they're probably questioning my capacity as a grown up, as a responsible male who oversees a family system, right? No, nowhere in that, in his mind, in his psyche, not a single part of him would question his capacity or competence as a grown up and as a parent and as a husband. As soon as that person, as, see, as soon as I see that driveway, pull into the driveway, all of a sudden, my quality and my capacity as a mother, a partner, a person who maintains the house, despite being a professional who has a full-time job outside of said house, I internalize that. 
And I think it's a representation of me because I grew up in a house where I saw that's how my mom experienced drop by company. And my dad never carried that. And Jeff grew up in a house similar. So it's not that we stress differently in the sense of like our biology, cortisol is consistent between males and females. It's different in terms of what we've been told is important. That is, again, an epiphany. And it feels like my life. And I think that people listening will will feel the same thing. It's so interesting how we, it is how we're brought up. It is how we're, what we see around us. So then it makes me think, what are we teaching our children, right? What kind of house do, you know, I feel like I'm always frazzled, yet I th- I must bring, and I also feel like I must bring that on myself. Like I'm the one that wants to have the clean kitchen. I'm the one that wants to have everybody's clothes picked up off their floor. Yeah. I'm the one that wants to. So I guess is, Am I bringing on my own stress or do I just not know better because this is this is the way I was brought up. This is the way the 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 people around me are. My friends are the same way. Yeah. So Tamara, there's a dual truth here. So A, it is the fact that this is likely how you were raised and how you were taught and how are we identify and and again, what we want to be known for. Right. We want to be known as organized and, and responsible and like we have our all of our ducks in a row. Like we want to put across that we are in, you know, we're in charge, yet many of us are tired and wired. Like we are so tired, we are wired, we're all keyed up trying to do all of these moving things. And the second dual truth about it is that like that sense of order, that sense of control when our lives are really full and there's a lot of things that are outside of our control, it's like maybe you can't address, for example, right now in Canada, we're navigating wildfires that are really impacting so many communities. I have zero capacity to be able to do anything then other than throw support and prayers behind that. But I can keep my room clean. I can keep my kitchen clean. I can like make sure my driveway is shovel. Like there's things that are within my control. And the more that there are things outside of our control in the big world, the more we're going to focus and kind of get that like zero zoned in focus on those small things like the tidy kitchen. So I think it's a dual truth. It's the reality that we need that sense of control because control equals a sense of safety, that we feel safe when we have a plan, when we are in charge, we feel helpless. And I'll tell you, for most of us high performers, the feeling we don't like to feel is helpless, right? We don't like to feel that. So we find ways to put up our actions and our energy into a direction. We tunnel it somewhere or focus it. So many of us do that on our homes. Oh, that's so interesting. And uh, again, I identify with that very much. So let's start with sleep. Because yeah, okay. I, I have so many questions for you. I'm like, I'm going to ask your 10 questions right now. But let's start okay. with sleep. Is so, it a sign that you're really stressed? Yeah. So actually in the book that we that we put together, it's again, research over decades, really trying to get a sense of like what it is to navigate and be well in this very unwell world with all of these different pressure points. And one of the things that we know is that we discovered and we talk about these eight realms, right? There's eight areas that if we can be tender and give a little bit of attention to, that's what we see people can really get into a place of their stride. They feel grounded and in flow. And of the eight realms, Tamara, number one is the physical realm. It's our physical wellness. And when we talk about our physical wellness, so often we think about like nutrition and and, and exercise. The big key around our physical wellness is the component of sleep. And we know that we're in that place of distress. Again, when we're tired and wired, we're like we go to lie down and our brain is racing and we have so much that we're thinking about working, trying to hold tight to. And unfortunately, instead of actually winding down, what happens is we usually just try to distract ourselves. We scroll for hours. We, you know, we watch mindless things because we're actually not we're actually at technically to where we're overstimulated and we don't know how to pull it back. So we just go into numbing behavior. So scrolling's numbing behavior, watching shows in the evening while scrolling and petting your pet and talking to your partner. It's all just kind of this numbing behavior. So it's one of those things we often say is like, how do you feel after the behavior? Right. So like after that behavior, how do you feel? So after you, you know, scroll for a couple hours, like, do you feel energized? Do you feel rested? Do you feel really grounded? And then that's usually that kind of indicator because we are our own experts. You know you better than anyone. Even as somebody as a scientist who studies this, you know you better. 
So when you just take that moment to reflect or pause, that's where we start to get some of this really useful data about whether or not this is working for us, our behavior, or if it's working against us. And sleep is a big example when often we're working against what our body needs. Oh, yeah. So then that brings me to this feeling of, you know, deep fatigue, this feeling of, you know, every time I talk to someone, you know, they'll say to me, how are you doing? Or I'll say, how are you? And oh, I'm so tired. Exhausted. Because, and we're all so tired. We're all so exhausted. And the world feels exhausting right now. There's, I mean, every time we turn on the news, it's just exhausting to see the trauma that is happening worldwide at every angle, it seems. So I find that really stressful. But I don't want to not know. You know what I mean? Like, I, I'm a curious person. I like to read the news, watch the news, listen to the news. That can be very stressful. But it's this idea that we're all so tired. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's... that's, that's Yes, that is. And we actually talk about that as uh, that's what we call the, that we've hit the threshold, that we've moved past just our optimal stress where we have good energy. We know things are important and our lives are full. We've actually then crossed this threshold into what we call distress. And at first it starts with fatigue. Then it goes into that deep dis uh, exhaustion that you're describing. And unfortunately, from that exhausted point, it's a slow, steady erosion into burnout. And I think so often people misunderstand that burnout is associated only with work, like work outside of the home. Like if you are in these roles, then you can experience burnout. Burnout is is universal. It's when we're not matching the amount of rest we need with the activity or output we're trying to do. So persons who don't work outside of the home, they also can experience burnout. But we can say, for example, if we're in a professional setting, Tamara, we can say like, oh, my boss. My boss is really difficult. I'm exhausted. It's too much. If we say that about our families, we look like bad people, right? Like there's this kind of moral association. If I say like, oh, I love my teenagers dearly and I need just five minutes to myself, people are going to say, appreciate those years, Robin. They go by so fast. You're going to miss them when they're gone. I'm not going to be present for them today if I don't take a few minutes for myself. And there's no shame in that. And there shouldn't be any guilt in that either. Uh, and we do feel guilt and we do feel shame for even thinking about it. Like I always say, like, they're like, oh, how are the kids? And I'm like, oh, they're exhausting me. Like, I'm like, this is the hardest thing I've ever done. Three teenagers. It's it's hard. I had no idea. I mean, I love it, but it's hard and it's exhausting. And you've got all these schedules. And so I, I, I mean, I feel that greatly. So tell me about your stress. Are you, have you been stressed? Have you, I mean, listen, I know that you, you know, you have five degrees and you were a professor by the age of 27. So I assume that there was some stress leading up to that and around that. Yeah. Well, I can share with you, Tamara, the, the big stress was, yes, I hear the professor at 27, but was being a high school dropout at 16. As somebody who's overcome addiction, somebody who navigates mental health, learning disabilities, and ADHD, um, yeah, I have some pretty amazing accolades I've been able to achieve. And I've also taken a very nonlinear route uh, to get to where I am. So I have experienced stress in many different ways, in many different versions and different seasons of my life. Stress has looked remarkably different at different times. What I can share with you right now where I'm at, now that I understand how my stress manifests for me, I know what my stress looks like for me and what distress looks like. I can share with you that I've been in a state of pretty, pretty, I gotta tell you, it's pretty blissful when all of a sudden you can get to that place where you understand yourself so well. I know who I am. I know who I am not. And I know where my strengths are and I put energy there so I can share in all honesty, even with three teenagers, very full lives, a full time role in multiple different roles, um, as well as traveling around the world. Um, my stress levels are extremely low. But you didn't you didn't just wake up and have no nope. uh, low stress levels. Nope. This has been it, it didn't just be like, you know what, I'm going to be an expert on stress and oh, I have no more stress that this took work. I, it's earned on your part, it's earned right yes definitely. it's earned it's to earned. feel like this yeah so tell me how does someone do that 
Yeah. How does someone learn to do what you did? Thank you uh, for asking that question. So yeah, this is earned. This is earned knowledge. This isn't something that I once read in a book and then be like, oh, I'm going to apply it because we can have every self-help book on the shelf. Like, and I even love the act of buying self-help books. I don't read them, but I feel good about myself buying them, right? I just feel good that I own it or I've at least on my Amazon card, it says that past <laughs> history purchases. Robin bought a book on meditation once, yes. right? So so for me, it's this idea. We talk about this in psychology, Tamara, about integration. So how do we take what we learn and how we live? And then how do we braid truth into a place where it's like, this is how it makes sense for me. And I think for me, where the starting point was after I got through, again, trauma, after I got through a lot of complexities in terms of relationships and I got to a place where it's like, okay, so here's the next season of my life, right? Here I am at beginning, day one, the next chapter of my life. It was getting radical clarity on who I am and who I am not. And I recognize I am not the parent who is going to have the clean house. I am not the professor who is going to stay in a lab 12 hours a day and ignore my kids. I am not, right? I'd, so again, getting this clarity of who I am and who I am not, and then figuring out, if I want to be this person, if this is who I am, and these are my signature strengths, these are my talents, but this is also my story, my lived experience, my realities, what does that look like? And so for me, it was very much getting that clarity about who I am and how do I want to show up for the people who matter most to me. So it's, it's again, it's that idea of it's, it's not one day. And I'll share with you one of the biggest traps I see, especially for women, is this idea about when, then. So it's like, okay, so when the kids are older, then I'm going to be able to look after myself. When their house is clean, then I'm going to feel good and grounded. When I get that holiday, then I'm going to unwind. But then we go on the holiday and we bring all of this emotion. We bring all of the guilt. We bring all of the feelings with us. So we have to start figuring out strategies that are personal to us so that we can be okay in the moment. And the other big idea is stop waiting for someone to rescue us. Like stop waiting for somebody to like fix it uh, because we get to be the architect of what our days look like. And when we take our power back and say like, yeah, I'm not that person. I'm okay with not being that person who maybe the society says I should be or I ought to be, but say, no, no, this is me. And when we start to embrace and for me, I can share again as somebody with ADHD, it's like I see the world differently and stop fighting against that versus, well, what does that mean? about me. But then what does that mean about me as a mother? What does that mean for me as a professional? And I can share with you when I, with my three teenagers, the thing I'm most proud of with my three teenagers is that they are bestest friends. Like I have a boy, girl, boy, and they're bestest friends and their siblinghood is so strong and so tight. And when I ask them about like, what is it that I bring to this as me, as Robin, as your mom, what do I bring to this? They will share with you. It's like, it's like you bring this, you're fun. Like, you bring this ease and you bring fun. And like that really was, again, one of the super strengths of ADHD is I could, I can bring fun and I can. And again, I think that makes a big difference, especially when they're feeling the weight of the world, right? Like right now, our teenagers are growing up in this era of anxiety where everything is scary. Everything, the future does not look bright. And if you have somebody who shows up and says, hey, you know what? It's going to be okay. I don't know how it's going to be okay, but it will. And you don't have to walk it alone. And hey, let's go to this concert and have some fun and let's play. That makes our teenagers feel really safe. Ooh, that is so good too. Because we forget they're carrying around, you know, these computers in their hands. They're not phones, they're computers. And we all have access to any information anywhere in the world, any time of day. And that's stressful. That can be very stressful. Scrolling uh, Instagram or TikTok or whatever it can be very stressful. Like, I like to look at it for gardening ideas now. Yeah. I find that relaxing. <laughs> yeah. But now I'm stressed out because I haven't planted my lettuce and I haven't planted my this and I haven't. I'm like, whoa, everybody's garden looks good and mine looks awful. And yeah. like, what are you doing, Tamara? This is supposed to be nice and relaxing for you. So <clears throat> I want to talk about stressing wisely and what that means. But before we do that, we like to ask our guests to choose a Canadian nonprofit um, so that we can thank you for being here. And we will be giving, uh, you chose the Kids Help Phone. We love the Kids Help Phone here. We've talked to them on this podcast. 
Uh, and we will be giving them $500 in your name as a thank you for you being here, Robin. So thank you for choosing the Kids Help Phone. Thank you. So what does it mean? Your book is called Stress Wisely. What does that mean, Stress Wisely? Yeah, so Stress Wisely means that we learn about ourselves enough so that way we know how to show up in every angle and every dimension in our life, Tamara, in a way that works for us and works to be of service for others. So it's figuring out what it what is that we have to do, what is it that we have to stop doing. And what we've done in the book is essentially created this blueprint for people to do their own self-discovery because there's not one way to do this. There's not one strategy or one technique. What we need to do is take somebody's lived experience. We then need to take kind of what their goals are and what matters most to them. And then essentially what we've tried to do in this book and what I believe we have done is create enough education as well as strategy and application so that way people can put those practices into their life starting today. So this is day one. It's day one. It's not something that our wellness isn't as far away as we think it is. And I think that's one of the big misconceptions about stressing wisely is that like one day we're going to get there. We can start there right now. And I'll give you a really quick example. Uh, Yesterday, um, I was doing a lot of moving parts, lots of press, lots of activities. And I had like 20 minutes. And my first reaction was to be like, you know what? I'm just going to grab a coffee. Coffee helps. It's like literally my fuel on life. And I just, I'm a better person when I'm caffeinated. I'm like, you know, I'm just going to grab a quick coffee. I'm going to push through. And then I realized, you know what actually will make me feel better in this moment is to still have that cup of coffee, Tamara, but I'm going to take it outside. And I'm just going to spend some time outdoors, just 20 minutes drinking my coffee outside, not at my desk trying to push through one more task, 20 minutes outside. And I'll share with you after that 20 minutes, well, first of all, caffeine takes about 20 to 30 minutes to activate. So I was just starting to get the up wave of energy that it so generously gives us. But then because I had spent some time outdoors, got that fresh air, I got that sunshine that does great to helping re-regulate my nervous system. I sat back down at my desk 20 minutes later and I felt so much better and I felt well in that moment. So our wellness is one choice away. It's one choice away is what's my next right choice that's actually going to help me feel better in what I need to do next. And I think it's a series of just braiding all of those together to create these beautiful lives. Because if we take it in baby steps, it's probably a lot easier on us. Absolutely. If we just, because I think that sometimes we find ourselves, well, first of all, is it, is it unusual? Like, do you think I'm the only person that thinks that, oh, if I sit down and like, people are going to think like that I'm lazy. Like I am constantly like cleaning something or, you know, folding laundry or whatever it is. And every now and then I have some rage. Yeah. About how I do everything around here. Like even my youngest always says, I do everything around here. And she copies me and I'm like, well, I do. And she's like, okay. And you know what I mean? Like, so there's this idea in the back of the head that goes, if you sit down right now, you're going to, it's, you'll never get back up. And you're, because you're so tired and you need to finish doing this, this, and this. Yeah, it's the inner critic, right? Our inner critic will take over and be like, you're lazy. You need to earn your worth. Get up and perform. Because again, that's that part of us that we're just trying to feel safe. And if we do everything and we're always busy, nobody can accuse us of being lazy or accuse us of being freeloaders or whatever that inner critic is trying to prevent you from being or feeling. Now, the reality is if we meet that with an inner coach, Okay, so let's say you do say, I'm going to take those 20 minutes. An inner coach is going to say, you know what, Tamara, this is your best choice. You got 20 minutes. Enjoy your rest. Unwind. Close those eyes. Re-regulate because my goodness, we're going to put you back in. We're going to put you back in on the floor and you're going to get to work and you're going to do all of those things that are, that you need to get done. So that inner critic is going to like judge you and make you feel shame and guilt. Your inner coach, if we can shift that narrative and say, okay, this is what's going to happen, right? You're going to take 20 minutes. You're going to give a rest, right? No professional athlete plays every minute on the floor or on the ice or on the field, right? They get breaks, they pull them back and they put them back in with radical focus on what it is you need to do next. Because I'll share with you one of the observations where I see is we're very busy, but we're not necessarily effectively busy. Like we're not busy effectively. Like we're like, we're kind of chasing our tails, so to speak, right? We're we're not like, it's like, it's not that we're like, 
in with really good focus and clarity. What is that I need to do? What is that deliverable? We're just kind of like coasting and we're just puttering and we need to actually realize that if I take that 20 minute break and I get clarity of like, okay, you know what? I need to empty that dishwasher. I need to do those three things, get clarity and go and do it. You're going to push through those to do items appreciably faster than if we just kind of like do this low puttering. But there's also a place for low puttering as well, right? It doesn't have to be all Absolutely. or nothing. Absolutely, yeah. A low putter is yeah. like great. Absolutely. Well, so you it know. helps process emotion. It right, really tidy. does. That's it his process for sure. And you know, you, you said something that made me think of my friend Kelly and she does something she calls a 15 minute kitchen shakedown. Yes. Where she sets her timer for 15 minutes and she goes to town on the kitchen, like, you know, after yeah. dinner or whatever it might be, or late at night when it's a mess, boom, it's done. And then she's able to, and I'm like, why don't I do that? Because, you know, I'm like everybody else, right? Why am I not doing that? That's so smart. And then you you talk yourself, you know, down for a while going, well, why didn't I think of that? Da, da, da. Meanwhile, things are piling up, but it's like, it's those little, you're, if I'm hearing you correctly, you're saying, you know, like baby steps, small chunks. What can I do? How can I rest myself today for even 20 minutes, 10 minutes, anything to just sort of like check back into yourself how you're feeling? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I have kind of two threads that I want to pull on there for. Yes. The yes. first one is just that idea of like consistency, small steps, compound, right? So if you do the, the small things well, even just once kind of check in with yourself, see, is this working and trust the process and figure out some patterns that work, that's going to carry you through. The second, I encourage people to think about their days in quarters. Okay, so I mean like having like a morning quarter, kind of a midday quarter. Now I'll tell you my morning quarter when our children was little was literally just to get them out of the house. It literally was that <laughs> hour in the first. That was already quarter one of the day. <laughs> and then nine o'clock to noon was like quarter number two. And then I had an afternoon and then I have an evening. And one of the things that I make sure I do, and I share this with a lot of folks that I work with, is you got to check in with yourself once a quarter, right? In the morning, midday, evening, or or afternoon and evening. Just check in with yourself and be like, hey, how am I doing? How am I feeling? How, how What's going on for me right now? And it's literally just a heartbeat of a check-in. But when we check in with ourselves, it pulls us out of autopilot, right? It pulls us out of us just in these routines and these habits. And then all of a sudden you might realize, you know what? These first two quarters of my day, they are, they are going great right? I'm chasing. I'm feeling overwhelmed. I don't like what this feels like. Well, you have two more quarters to do something differently, right? So you thinking already in that way as well, it's not like, oh, I had a bad day. Well, maybe you had a bad second quarter, right? But what did you do in quarter two to make quarter three more pleasant or more at ease? And one of the ways I love to, if I notice that my quarter two isn't going great, my strategy, Tamara, is I cut things off my to-do list. And that is so empowering to be like, well, you know what? Those three things, not today. And so taking agency of our days. And again, this isn't like woo-woo. It is science. This is how our brain works. This is how we can set ourselves up for success. And this is how we can start enjoying our lives again. Because I, one of the things we often talk about is living the dream, Tamara, shouldn't kill us. Eh, it's so true. Robin, this has been... Uh, I needed this conversation. I'm not the only one that needed this conversation. Thank you so much. Your book is called Stress Wisely. You have it there with you, right? Yeah, absolutely. There we go. Stress Wisely is the book. And also you voiced the audio book on that. So uh, you can also get the audio book. You can find uh, Robin's book, Stress Wisely, anywhere you get your favorite books. And you can also check out her website, which is Dr. Robin. That's D-R-O-R-O-B-Y-N-E. So Robin is R-O-B-Y-N-E dot C-A. And she's also on Instagram at Dr. D-R underscore Robin, R-O-B-Y-N-E H-D. Robin, thank you so, so much. Fantastic conversation. Wonderful. Thank you. Take good care, Tamara. Thanks for listening to another episode of Tell Us Talks with Tamara Taggart. Be sure to subscribe so you can join us every Tuesday for another conversation. You can also check out our website, tellus.com slash podcast, and subscribe to our YouTube channel at Tell Us Talks. 